So how are you doing, Ped? I'm fantastic. L- relatively speaking, fantastic. <laughs> Depends on what level, what, what concentric circle of my life you're asking about. Uh, I'm not asking about the, the inner circles. I don't want to know about that. Really? But the outer periphery, you know, that's good. It's good to know what's going on there. Really? So if, like, if I felt like I wanted to share the inner circle, you don't, you don't want any part of that? Uh, probably not, no. Uh, there's some things that people just should keep themselves. What, what if I'm like <laughs> reaching out to you, Tom? What if like I've been ramping up here to be able to share something with somebody that I've never been able to share with anybody and I've finally found my voice. Now you want to just shut me off? Well, I just, I, well, I wouldn't want to record it. Let's put it that way. <laughs> So th- since last time we recorded, uh, I got to see you in person. Yes, that was pretty weird. And I got to see Brother X in person. Yes. Which is always a treat. W- which one was more exciting for you, to see me in person or to see Brother X in person? Uh, to see Brother X, actually. It's been a while since I've seen him. And, you know, he's, he lives in Japan, and so I don't get to see him very often. And in fact, it occurred to me uh, just a little while ago that this is probably the first time in like 25 years I've seen both of you at the same time. <laughs> It's usually, usually either one or the other. Really? Yeah. So that was fun to see you two interact. <laughs> huh. Yeah. He's actually flying back to Japan tomorrow as we record. Yeah. And I, I had an opportunity to go see Arrival with him. This is a little bit of a little follow up. I, I uh, emailed you a, uh, quick, a quick video of his reaction. So he was kind of ambivalent towards it. I gather from his little meh gesture. Not, not to review the... The movie, you know, again, the whole thing, but his, one of his basic takes, so you remember at the, one of the big points in the movie where the alien is explicitly telling Louise what the gift is and she's, he says, um, or the alien says, a weapon opens time, Louise sees future. Yeah. So Brother X was disappointed that they didn't explore the nature of time more rather than focusing just on the nature of language and our understanding of of time. So she, she, she then uses that tool, right? To like, yeah. remember the future, quote unquote, We're all with this sort of unstated presumption that, you know, therefore reality is this deterministic thing, that there's one flow of events that you could therefore see in either, dire- either direction. And that the heptapods just happen to have a language where they could see both ways. But he was like, oh, well, what about the nature of time? So he was, he was a little, little bummed about that. He has very high standards for movies. So. Oh, I know, I know, I know that. If it doesn't have Khan or Pizza the Hut, <laughs> then your, your chance of getting five stars out of five is pretty small. Yeah, so. yep. Wrath of Khan and Spaceballs is the pinnacle of, <laughs> pretty much. of, of international cinema. <laughs> yes, and for, uh, what else does he love? Forbidden Planet and uh, Time Machine. Yeah. And all that stuff. So yeah, I've seen all those things with them. Yeah. The, the, other, the other bit of follow-up uh, related to Brother X, I, I was really pleased to, to hear that he's planning on returning to the U.S. next summer for the eclipse. We convinced him to come see that. Yes, he was sparked by your um, poetic and passion description in our pilot episode, Tom. So kudos to you. Oh, shucks. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> see, Tom, we, we just need to find the right venue for your... The full expression of your your innermost circle of heart, and then it just flows, and, and it touches touches the um, touches the hearts of humanity. Tom, oh stop! <laughs> the follow up I had for him was uh, you probably saw I sent him an email. Uh, there's going to be a another eclipse in Japan in 2035. So if he doesn't make it back to the U.S., you can probably see that one. 2035, <laughs> another 20 years or 18 years. 18 years, yeah. So that would be would be good excuse to go visit Japan. If, so if you were completely unencumbered and you had, you know, your millions of dollars from your podcast fame, would, <laughs> would, would, would traversing the globe in search of total eclipses be high on your uh, recreational to-do list? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, lo- I love traveling anyway, but to do so to capture eclipses would be fantastic. I mean, I was just, I was just actually looking at the, when I was looking up the Japan eclipse, I was looking at the list of upcoming eclipses for the next 20, 30 years or so, just to see what else is gettable we mentioned the one in 2024 that's going to be in the u.s right there's going to be another in 2019 and 2020 both the path of totality will be crossing 
through Chile and Argentina. Wow. So I've never been to South America, but so that might be a good time to go. Wow. And in, starting in 2028, from 2028 to 2038, there's going to be four total solar eclipses in Australia. Four total? In the span of 10 years, there's going to be four total, yes. So you're pretty much considering just like moving there for a spell. <laughs> At least making a few trips there. So if we have any listeners in Australia, you know, put those on your calendar. Yeah, right. So, so Tom, let me ask you this, because you described in our episode one, your a very moving experience when you were in France and you saw the first, you, that was your first experience of being in the path of totality, right? That's right. Yes. And, and how many have you seen since then? Zero. Oh. <laughs> oh. That was, that was my one opportunity to see one that I've been able to take advantage of. Yes. Ah, well, then my next question is going to have to be a, to be continued because based on what I read from other eclipse chasers, they, they sort of describe that like, okay, it's never going to be like your first time, but it's still very, very good. Well, we'll have to uh, we'll have some follow-up after I see my second one. Yeah. Hopefully that will be this August if everything works out. The reason why I was initially thinking about this concept of novelty versus the experience in itself was, so because you brought up Brother X and, you know, he does triathlons. Yeah. You've mentioned that. Yeah. Right. Which, which you are well on your way to accessing now that you've... <laughs> entered your, your C25K period. Oh, you're, you're, you're funny. <laughs> it could have. I mean, there's a non-zero chance of it, right? Yeah, it's, it's a, there's a non-zero, but it's very infinitesimal. What do you think would have to happen to increase it to like 1%? Like for you to do a triathlon within the next five years? Uh, probably a head transplant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so some, or something of the equivalent, like like massive car accident, yeah, exactly. We can rebuild a <laughs> huge cybernetic exoskeleton or something like we, that. <laughs> we have the technology. We can do it. So he does triathlons. And so he described to me the experience of crossing the finish line uh, after his first triathlon. And uh, I mean, I can't, I can't do it justice, but he just describes this experience of just this overwhelming euphoria, clarity, and like connection and just ultra presence with the moment like like he's he was like eating a bagel and it was like the most amazing bagel he had ever eaten and he was talking to somebody about some nondescript thing that happened and it was like the most interesting engaging experience you know ever and he said that lasted for a few minutes that sort of just peak high and since then he has done other triathlons and he's had a similar experience but it hasn't been as overwhelmingly impactful so when i saw him recently he was really giving me the full court press and trying to convince me into Start up uh, training. <laughs> yeah, he wants me to do triathlons too. And I'm like, I, I saw him do just a, a swim across the Boston Harbor a few months ago. He's like, oh, you got to get in there. You got to get in there. And I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, Tom, but I'm, I'm a bit hydrophobic. Yes, as am I. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> we can we not swim together. <laughs> yeah, it's gotten a little better because my wife and kids are all great swimmers and they love the water. So they've just through need and association, I've, I've toned down my general fear, but I still don't prefer to be in the water for a number of reasons. It's a rich tapestry, but he was, but, but so brother X was like, oh dude, you have to come and swim with me next time. I'm like, there's just no way. He's like, but come on, you saying there's a chance? Like well, what, what would have to happen in order to be, I was like, if, if one of my kids' lives were on the line, I could swim across the harbor. Sure. <laughs> I couldn't make myself do it, but there's, there's, no, there's no preference motivation that's going to drive me towards that. So. Yeah, I don't have a lot of desire to engage in activities that if you screw up, you could die. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I guess to be fair, if you knew how to swim, there's not that much of a chance of dying by just swimming in like a lake or, or whatever. Like, I get paranoid going to the beach uh, about the riptide, and then I can acknowledge that, okay... My analysis of the risk of the riptide is being exaggerated by my distaste for the water. <laughs> like, no, I, in general, I don't like to take unnecessary risks. Unnecessary risk, right. Yeah. You know, I, I say that to myself that like, okay, if there was a necessary risk, then I'll, I'll take it. However, then I, I start to question myself, well, if I have such a general aversion to risk in general, when that rare opportunity comes that there is a need to take a necessary risk, will I be able to do it, right? Like, am I so out of practice 
And so then, then that makes me think of like, well, yeah, and so I could sort of see the benefit of doing things where you're intentionally, to, to a mild degree, confronting your fears, right? Here's something that doesn't make me feel comfortable, yet I know conceptually it's safe. Let me do it in order to at least get over the emotional inhibition that might someday keep me from doing something that I need to do. Yeah. <laughs> That's not convincing to you. <laughs> no. no. My, to- my tolerance of risk uh, basically maxes out at talking on the internet in my basement. <laughs> there was some aspect of that when I went on the Six Flags roller coaster for the first time last summer. Like the really big one where you go up this like really steep grade and uh, that my kids had been on like a hundred times. And I had, I had no desire to do it. I was like, why do I want to hurdle my body through space like that? But I knew conceptually that it was safe. So I did it. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it was an unenjoyable rush of adrenaline that I do not <laughs> prefer to do again. Yeah. I feel the same way about those. Yeah. I don't think I've done a roller coaster in a long, long time. Yeah. Although I'm not going to do triathlons. On a related note, though, I did get myself a new toy. A new toy? Yes. Is it a new toy that I don't know about yet? Yes. Oh, can I guess? What? On a related note to triath- um, my first guess is a Fitbit. You are correct, sir. I did get myself a Fitbit. Ah, man, I'm good. I've, <laughs> I've, I've got you fairly deconstructed already, Tom. Is this, was this an outgrowth of your C25K um, exercise rejuvenation experience? Uh, I think so, yeah. I mean, uh, just an overall self-improvement kick, you know? And right. I've had a pedometer for years because I, I do a lot of walking. Uh, but now I've upgraded to one of those wristband kind of Fitbits that does all the extra cool stuff. <laughs> what color is it? It's black. It's black. Was that intentionally, uh, did you want it to look like a watch as opposed to a fashion accessory? Yes. I didn't want a fashion accessory. I just wanted something that was going to do like the heart rate monitoring stuff and, and has the GPS in it so you can tie it to your phone. Do you, how long have you been wearing it? Uh, about, about two weeks now. Do you wear it at work? I do. That actually, that was one of the first things I struggled with uh, with this because it's a wristband, right? And I've always worn uh, an analog watch, uh, you know, on one wrist. Mm. So for for a while, I was trying to figure out whether I could get away with having a watch on one hand and then the Fitbit on the other wrist, right? But that just seemed really weird to me. <laughs> <laughs> and you you, you are averse to being or looking really weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, to a certain extent, I tried it for a few days. Uh, eventually, I, I had to give it up because it just it was just too weird for me. I, I couldn't I couldn't handle having <laughs> things on both wrists. <laughs> so I had the, I've had to give up the watch, and now I have the Fitbit on my watch wrist. Which I mean, it, it does do the time on it as well, like a watch. Oh. you also can uh, download a mobile app that that pairs with it, and mm-hmm. so it gives you all kinds of uh, charts and data and all kinds of things. <laughs> it's, it's, if you like. Uh, tracking things right it's it's, it's very useful because you can see all these little data points that you can track over days do you have like a daily um step goal that you try to achieve yes i do and like so like if it gets to be like 5 6 p.m and you're like yo i'm like through a few hundred steps beyond my goal you just go like run around the house yeah absolutely sweet you you gotta get that little you know star <laughs> <laughs> chasing the stars although i i, I kind of get the sense that this thing is slightly trying to flatter me. <laughs> well, it's an exercise in psychology, right? It's like... It pe- is, it is. People, I assume this thing is popular not just because it gives you data, but because it's a, um, it's, it's a motivational tool. Yeah, it, it, it is. And it, it gives you all kinds of suggestions and ratings and stuff like that. Like, I'm a bit suspect, though, because it tells me <laughs> I have excellent cardio fitness, which I just find completely <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> what parameters is it basing... It's conclusion that you have excellent cardio fitness. Uh, just on like my resting heart rate and a few other factors that it, like my age, huh. obviously. Well, so what you've described to me before is that while you're not a world-class athlete, you're not 100% like couch-bound sedentary. You do a fair bit of walking and stuff. Yeah. So I, I kind of suspect I'm being graded on a curve here. <laughs> I wonder if it's, you know, location aware. Like if I was in like the Netherlands. Yeah. Where everyone is like six foot four, yes. and bike, bikes to work. Yes. going to tell me, it's, you know, it's perhaps a bit damning by faint praise, you know, relative to the standard issue American. You're in great <laughs> right. shape. Yeah, you, you can do a flight of stairs. You get a star. 
Based based on our infrared scan, your body shape is not a sphere. Therefore, <laughs> good job. So I'm I'm a little suspect about its how it's rating me, but overall, I think it's a positive purchase. Mm. Yeah, that actually brings up some some more concerning issues about how 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 do people you know as generations follow generation, and the the sedentariness increases and the obesity epidemic gets worse, and then how how you feel you're doing. Is I guess in any in any uh, endeavor is is a combination of of objective measurement and then comparing to others. Like like we, we've we've talked a little bit about um, offline about healthy eating and 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 what's to eat etc. And that there, there's another uh, vein where if you simply compared yourself to the average American or or what is presented in culture, you really don't have to do a lot in order to feel like you're eating well. I mean, as long mm. as long as you are not destroying your body. <laughs> <laughs> with an endless stream of nasty inputs, you're doing okay compared to the rest of the population. But but, that, yeah. but but that's a far cry from like what is actually good for you and healthy. Yeah, you know, when I've traveled overseas and I've talked to people, uh, the overwhelming characteristic people think about when they think of Americans is that they're amazed about how fat they are overall. <laughs> it's like the first thing they talk about. Right, right. Like, I visited the U.S. and I, can't, I couldn't believe how fat everyone is. <laughs> That does not bode well for the country, does it? Well, that's why we need our Fitbits, I guess. Yeah, I guess. So uh, have you noticed, so two weeks now you've had the Fitbit. Yeah. Have you noticed any, uh, or rather has the Fitbit said that there has been any uh, noticeable exercise health improvement as a result of wearing this Fitbit? I don't think uh, in this short of a time I can really make any judgments as of yet, but it's it's good to track these things, I guess. I can see the benefit of tracking this kind of data because you see these things over time what direction the graphs are going in and that that's informs what you can improve on if if you could swallow a pill and have a 24 7 biosensor in your physical person which then uh recorded a wide variety of biosensor data that you could then use would you do it yeah uh, it's it's interesting I, I i think i might i don't know I was thinking of this the other day uh, because we got a uh, new a new little tablet for one of my kids. Yeah, and I was just it, it really we just got it for like very simple apps and and basically as a book reader, just a cheap uh, little tablet. And as I'm just going through the initial setup, there's like five or six different screens about do you want to share this data and store it to the cloud? Do you want to share this data? and store it to the cloud. Are you okay with this advertising ID being tied to this, right? And, you know, there's this general concept that when you use any service, if you're not paying for it, then you're the product. Exactly right. Right? Yeah. So, like, we, we talked about the wonders of Facebook uh, in our previous episode, Tom. By the way, visit our Facebook page at <laughs> facebook.com slash geeks. But, uh, but what, what, the reason why you're the product, right, is that it's collecting this treasure trove of personal data on you. And then you're agreeing to allow Facebook and these other services. I'm not just trying to vilify Facebook, but Amazon and Google and Microsoft and all of these companies want your personal data so that it can be associated with an advertising ID profile, which then can be sold. And so, okay, I guess that's not too big of a deal if if I'm getting this great service as a trade off for having to look at a an ad on you know my Facebook feed or whatever website that's following me around, but then of course it gets into government data, right? I mean we mm. e- even before 2017 and beyond there have been some major issues right with uh, the government wanting to get into this personal data that these companies are all collecting, and this has always been an issue of the government wants your electronic data but but the reason why this fitbit biosensor tablet thing made me think of it all is that now our default storage mechanism is the cloud going forward from this point on you really have to make a conscious decision that your data is going to be stored offline and not connected or backed up online if you don't want it pretty much easily accessible by companies the government etc at any point that's right i am in fact sharing my fitbit data with, I mean, it's tied to my Fitbit account, right? So it's it's stored in the cloud, right? And I do voluntarily share it with my employer. Really? Yes, because our HR department has a program where if you wear these little fitness tracking devices, they will they will pay you in like gift cards and stuff like that. 
for the benefit of getting that data, basically. So, but I mean, I, I do it basically because I walk so much. It's just basically free money for me. Right. The default tendency now is to, is to store all your data on the cloud and you really have to make a conscious decision if you're going to store your data locally. And so how comfortable are we with not just what movies I like and, and what, what did I share with this person on Facebook, but, but your full biosensor data available to companies and advertisers and the government. And like, if, you're, if your Fitbit shows you that you're diabetic, do you, want, do you want drug companies sending you targeted advertisements? Oh, God, no. Yeah. I mean, I, I think with the Fitbit, the, the amount of data in there is basically doesn't exceed past what you would be utilitarian for you to just track your fitness goals. Um, I don't think there's anything else in there that is especially concerning. Yeah. Uh, if there was, a, if I was wearing a device that tracked a few lot, a lot of other things, uh, I'd be very concerned about where that was shared. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's the reason I ask is that you know I, I see Fitbit is just the first. This is the first bio sensor that that is integrating into our our physical self. All right. This is mm. the this is the first Borg implant. <laughs> I mean, the the notion of of having something that you know that you either wear or that you ingest. Or that is sutured somewhere, or is somehow otherwise attached to your person, that is collecting a lot more data, which you know could be used for good. That that's that's coming in our lifetime, I would believe, and, and unless this iteration of civilization burns itself out before we get to that point. Yeah, yeah. Have you uh, have you ever tried any of these kind of devices? No, no, I have not. Is, it, is that because you have no interest, or because of the sharing concerns? I mean, like we have. We haven't talked seriously in depth about uh, data security, but just from my, and, and you're a grizzled IT nerd, Tom, so you know a thing or two about data security. But I mean, my, my general feeling on security is, is that you should pretty much assume that anything that you share is unsecured. <laughs> There's no presumption of privatization of information. And so that's, that to me is kind of a, that's kind of a scary thing. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very sympathetic to that viewpoint, and it's certainly something like we said before. We have to, we have to keep in mind these things. Yeah, like, and and I think that the crossing over into into different levels of engagement with personal data and how that's going to affect not just marketing but everyday life. And you know, we talk about the Internet of Things. I mean, now we have a everybody has a computer in their pocket, a really jazzed up supercomputer with lots of cool sensors and connectivity in the. Um, form of a smartphone. But the next step to that is, you know, imagine if there were smartphones that were very small, that were embedded in everything. Like there was a smartphone in your chair, there was a smartphone in your refrigerator, there was a smartphone in your bicycle, there was a smart... And that's pretty much what the internet of things is, from, from my basic understanding, right? is that you have internet connectivity and sensor connectivity and data streaming everywhere. And so, you know, crazified notions like... Um, Tom Cruise uh, running around a minority report, ripping out his eyeballs so that he's not caught up in the uh, retina sensor by the government. You know, that, that kind of stuff is a lot closer <laughs> to, to this point in history than, than what I, I think we normally think of in terms of fantified sci-fi. Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be an ongoing struggle to, uh, balancing the obvious benefits of these kinds of technologies with the, with the complete loss of privacy. So there's definitely a part of me that just wants to like, you know, hike off into the mountains and garden and be done with it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> On the other hand, it's like, okay, well, I mean, I exist in this time and, you know, and I will for at least a little while, you know, what, whatever it is that I want to do or, or want to accomplish or want to be in the world, this, this is the, this is the framework of the world. So maybe it makes more sense to trying to achieve a certain level of balance and, and then engage with, with it as opposed to just rejecting it all outright. So Yeah, I'm with you there. But you get a couple of bucks for your, uh, for your troubles for the Fitbit. That's nice. So you have a monetary incentive from your employer. That's right, which is nice. Uh, they, you know, I, I suppose it's worth it to them to pay people to be more active, uh, to control healthcare costs for the insurance purposes. But right. The, the amount of data that is shared is, is to me, is, is not significant enough to be too concerned about. Right. And you'll, have, you'll have to keep us updated on that, Tom. Yeah. I, you know, I, I like getting the gift cards. 
But I'm sure there's a threshold it could cross where it, it would not be worth it. And that's going to be the constant struggle going forward in this technological future we're living in. Right. A couple other minor updates for you recently, Tom. Yes. A couple of follow-ups. Follow-ups, um, good. I had my first D&D session as a dungeon master. Very good. <laughs> so you, your, your influence is, is slowly seeping into the every fiber of my being. <laughs> as is, I apologize. As, I apologize. This is your nefarious plan. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I had told you I had bought the starter set and, um, my son and his friends were, were kind of interested. And so I, I read through the, just the very first couple chapters that the campaign that comes with it. This is the, uh, this is the Dungeons and Dragons, uh, starter set for the new fifth edition game. It just came out a couple years ago. Yeah. And the name of the campaign that I'm spacing on right now because of my sleep deprivation is the, uh, lost. The Lost Mine of Fandelver. Yes, thank you. So I had kind of read the rules, and then I had the box out when my son and his friends were over. And they were like, oh, oh, oh can, can we play? Can we, let's do it. Let's do it. And I was completely unprepared, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, really beyond the bare bones of like, uh, I guess you have to roll for initiative, and then how does combat work? But they were just so psyched about it that we just sort of just sat down and played. And uh, I was pretty loosey-goosey with, with the rules, right? Hey, that's the way we played it when we were kids, you know? Yeah, so there was, you know, hashtag overthinking it. Um, it w- when you initially gave me this idea, you know, I, I read online the di- different opinions about how one should approach uh, running a game and, uh, and how you create a, a good, enjoyable, interactive experience. And, you know, there's this uh, split between being hardcore, fast adherence to the rules and... Um, you're sort of just experiencing a, a preset thing versus being very kind of flexible with, with what you're doing. Right, right, right. You know, to, to the point where sometimes you're probably not even really playing D&D 5e as it's intended to be played, but, you, uh-huh. but, but you're using it as a means to an end to an experience. So, um, yeah, so I, I think I struck a, a fairly decent balance. They, they, had, they had a lot of fun. So, like, the first encounter in this campaign is uh, getting ambushed by goblins. I, I definitely fudged one or two of the rolls that would have um, annihilated one or two of them. Because <laughs> it was three players versus four goblins, and these goblins are pretty effective running in and out of the bush and avoiding. Right, right. It. But um, as luck would have it, they each rolled a natural 20 during the course of that battle and, and one of the other battles. And so, and they were very creative about expressing how it was happening. Like... Uh, like an arrow from a hundred feet away, you know, decapitating a goblin, and so that was it was cool. So, was this the first time that th- they have played something like this? Uh, for two of them, yes. One of them had had one experience with it before, and uh, yeah, and uh, you know, it, it had the desired effect. Like we played for a couple hours, they were all excited about it, and uh, you know, they want to play again. So, all right, that's great. Yeah. So, looking forward to that. Good, good, good. You have a lot of DM experience. Yes and no. Um. I did quite a lot of it back in the early <clears throat> 1980s. Uh, <laughs> Is that an intentional cough? <laughs> and then, uh, and then you know, you fall out of it for a while. And I got back into it recently in the last few years. And uh, I've done a lot of DMing uh, as play-by-forum games. Like an online kind of thing? Right. A play-by-post. Uh, it's a kind of a very slow way to play, but it's, it's easier if you have limited time which is kind of hard to sometimes get people organized to play a live game, you know, if you've right. got jobs and families and stuff like that. Uh, so I, I've done quite a bit of uh, play-by-post playing the last few years as a, as a DM, as a, as a game master. By post, do you mean posting in an online forum or receiving mail post? Posting in an online forum. There, there's lots of uh, forums online uh, that will support play-by-forum games. They have the, you know, dice tools in them and, and you can get notifications when there's new posts. Uh, so... As the, as the DM, I would set the scenario and type out descriptions of what's going on, and the other players would respond in character in the forum. And it, it, it's, it's a very slow process. But, you, you know, if you don't have a lot of time, you can play this way because every you can make it, you know, write up a post every day and send it off, and then people react to it, and then you come back to it the next day and write a response. And so it's kind of a more leisurely way to play. But right, right. It's, it's still get a, you still get a little charge out of it, you know, the same as it playing alive. Nice. So. Now, now, where do you come down in terms of uh, strict rules adherence versus sort of flexibly contouring, managing the experience? Um, 
I like rules. <laughs> <laughs> I do get that sense but, from you, though. But I also, I also understand that the, for, to have a successful game, uh, you can't be too adherent to the rules. And rules should be guidelines at best. Having fun is more important than adhering to the rules. Now, if, if they were going along in a campaign, right? And you're rolling for the monsters in a combat, and then boom, like it just wipes out half the party. Are you like, hey, that's what happens. That's part of the game. Or, or, if, or if you're making a sort of internal gut judgment, you know what? This is going to kind of kill the current enthusiasm. I'm going to fudge this a little bit. Would, would you, are you willing to do that? Are you willing to fudge? To me, fudging is only permissible when I've screwed something up somehow. <laughs> um, and I need to get the game back on track. If, if, if everyone's playing by the rules and I've given them fair warning that this is a difficult uh, situation that they're in and they still just blunder ahead, then I'm less apt to fudge because that's the kind of agreement you make with the players. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to present you with dangerous situations and you have to figure out the best way to get through it. You can't just rely on the, the DM's goodwill to save you. Yeah, and I get I guess long term, if if you always bail them out, then the actual sense of danger would be lost, right? Exactly, exactly. There's no sense of danger if you if you know you can always be saved. So there has to be a an, a real a real possibility of of character death or danger in the game, or else it cheapens the whole experience. I think. And so if you're going to fudge, you, you have to be very careful about when you do it. And you, you can't let the players let on that they, you, that you do fudge. Mm. Uh, so in, in my experience, I try to do it as as little as possible. Ideally, the, the correct amount of fudging you do is zero. Mm. But if you have to do it, it should be because that you've screwed something up and you have to correct things, you know, on the back end. Yeah, yeah. I when I when I fudged a couple rolls in this initial campaign, I, I was like I had set it up really like they were they could see like what I was rolling. And so, uh, you know, this goblin came up and rolled a 20 and he, I could see the look in this kid's eyes and I was like, okay, I'm not going to kill him. <laughs> 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 Particularly because it was like the first session, right? So I didn't want to yeah. like kill the mojo. Yeah. But uh, yeah. that's funny. How, how many total party kills, TPKs, have you ever had, Tom? Um, Is that a frequent occurrence? No, I don't think, uh, I don't think I've ever had any. Uh, so maybe I'm doing something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you should have at least one every once in a while just to make sure you make sure they know you mean it. Yeah. I mean, there are some <laughs> rules around individual character death where it's it's more uh, it's more likely that they're going to be knocked unconscious and be on the brink of death than be completely killed without possibility of coming back. So I'd imagine they'd really have to mess up in order to be dead without possibility of return. I think people um, react negatively when their characters are killed in some totally random reason yeah um so that's what you have to be careful of if the characters are going to be in a uh, dangerous situation you have to make sure that they're aware of that and then their their decisions will rule their fate rather than the dice yeah i I guess that's why i've been more uh in my mind willing to adjust on the fly because i mean i can read ahead in the campaign but because i've never really run through combat with a party i (laughs) i don't really have a accurate sense yet of you know, there's going to be this cave room with this troll and six goblins. How how dangerous is right. that actually? Right. Right. So yeah. it all comes with experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the more the more experience you get at this, the the amount of fudging you should do should trend towards zero. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think that I think that's legit. Oh, it's, although it's it's pretty amazing. You know, yet another example of the fractal nature of human interest, of of how much in depth, thoughtful, experience based discussion there is about how to run a uh, Dungeons and Dragons game. <laughs> yeah, and there's, there's a lot of different opinions of how to do it, and there's lots of different styles. Uh, I think ultimately it all depends on whether you're having fun or not. Yeah. So if, if you're having fun, whatever style you're doing it in, it's, that's A-OK. And, and like really creative, thoughtful people. Like it's, it, it just, it's, it always astounds me how like any, any area of human interest, there are like you know, creative, I don't want to say geniuses, but like just really gifted people who like are able to articulate. Like I'm sure like this in bird watching, there's like, you know, there's like people that are incredibly uh, articulate and uh, insightful about that, that angle of experience. It's just, it's just amazing. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm getting the itch to start up a game again soon because I've been on a kind of a hiatus from DMing for a while, uh, especially since I've been working on ramping up this podcast. 
but maybe when I get some more spare time, I might uh, start up a new game sometime soon. Mm. I'd like to uh, I'd like to start a, a do a live game too as well. Um, that's a much more that's a bigger commitment of time, so I, which I don't have at the moment. Yeah, are you a fan of the Adventure Zone podcast? Yes, I am. I've listened to it quite a bit. Um, that is one of the uh, other podcasts that I've begun listening to as a result of of this project. And that's a game that they play very uh, loose with the rules because they're they're uh, they're all about having fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's a good he's a good example of that. So I guess one of the core strategic things that is done differently in a m- more flexible game is this idea of um, what do they call that? A uh, theater of the mind or the uh, combat? It's so how you do combat, right? Right. Whether you have a have a tactical map with miniatures or whether you just do all combat in the in the imagination of their mind. Yeah, I I could find like very specific, you know, grid oriented, lay everything out with miniatures combat interesting from a tactical perspective, but that to me is not the main draw of of engaging in the overall narrative campaign. So I that's right. Yeah, I I guess I'm nothing against it. It's just not uh I I would tend to think it would slow down the overall experience unless you were really good at it. Yeah, I, I much prefer the theater of the mind style. Mm. Although you know, but some players really get into the uh, using the miniatures and the and the tactical the tactics of it. So you know, to each their own. To each their own, indeed. <laughs> so, speaking of to each their own, I have avoided a uh, experience in life for the last ten years or so, Tom. Okay. And uh, I I finally took the plunge. Okay. And uh, I, I wanted to, to talk about it with you briefly because, you know, looking back on our first several episodes here as we've been ramping up to publish and et cetera, we, we've done a lot of digital things, a lot of science-y things. We haven't really talked a lot of analog experiences, I, I guess with the exception mm-hmm. of uh, experiencing the, the, the eclipse and all that. But, but you're a big fan of hiking and, uh, and I, also, I also have a... A pretty strong desire to to connect with with the outdoors and the um the the tendencies I, I've been moving away from that for for whatever reason I just have not made the time to you know to to be outside and to to engage in the more analog nature of things. So this is yet another example of that. <laughs> so Tom, I now have a smartphone. Oh dear! Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> Which is we? I know you mentioned early on the earlier episode that you had a ten-year-old flip phone, and now you're you're switching to a smartphone, eh? Yes, I have a Google Nexus Five X that is sitting in okay. front of me right now. And what prompted this sudden change in your life experience? So it's it's been very non-sudden. It's you know my wife and kids have been on my case for a long time. So from our three directives here, Tom, of the interesting, the useful, and the frivolous. Yes. It's it's kind of I guess the most uh compelling one of those to convince me to go to a smartphone is the useful. They can be useful. Yeah, like I was pretty amazed. So I used the um the mapping application uh just just to drive home from work the other day. And mm-hmm. the the level of precision for of traffic density that it accounts for is unbelievable. <laughs> like I mean I was on a back road right circumventing the mainline traffic and you could it sort of mapped out the red yellow green um slowdowns ahead of me yeah, on this yeah. back road to the to a degree of like a few hundred feet and it's just uh, i mean uh, it's just unbelievable how that that kind of data can be incorporated so so simply from a gps perspective you know and um it's it's a lot easier to text and uh, the, i'm keeping up with you know some emails on other various topics and so that's so it has its utility. The reason why I wanted to talk to you about it, though, is that like I still feel very ambivalent about the whole experience. <laughs> you, you have a little twinge of regret that you've joined the majority now. I'm very concerned about the pull and effect it's going to have on my attention, because yeah. it would be naive to think that it's going to have no effect on my attention and behavior patterns. Yep. Yes. You have to be very careful about that. Yeah, and I've seen it affect other people in a negative way. Um, I've seen it affect other people in a positive way. And pe- people get new technology, they get excited about it. I'm very, <laughs> very like, I sort of pick this up and I like, I don't I don't yet trust it. You know what I mean? Like, 
it's a struggle for me. Like, even, like I thought that once I sort of got it, I would just jump in both feet forward. But it's, you know, I have the, um, the life preserver on in the, in the kiddie pool and I'm, I'm just sort of waiting around. So, yeah, I don't, it's, it, it doesn't feel comfortable yet, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's, it's been a difficult for me to integrate. <laughs> have you found yourself walking around with your head down looking at it like all the other people now instead of with your eyes forward looking at the world? No, but I will, to so not really, but I will admit to you that I was driving home one night and I did, I did check a text. I did like pick up the phone. And at, I yes, and I, I did what I... So it begins. Yeah, absolutely, right? <laughs> I mean, the amount of times I have mentally railed against my fellow drivers for doing this, and, and you know, and now for me to be doing the same thing, it's just like, uh Just put it somewhere where you can't reach it while you're driving. Yeah. The best thing you can do. Yeah. Then you don't have the temptation. Full disclosure, I should admit that I actually do, do not own a smartphone myself. What? I do not. I thought you had uh, an iPhone, No. I do have one, um, but I don't own it. It's it's given to me by work, so it's it's specifically my work phone. So I only really use it while I'm at, at work. I thought I was oh. joining your world, Tom. <laughs> no, and that you were going to be able I've to been... shepherd me through this process. No, I've been resisting it forever as well. I feel betrayed, <laughs> dude. You should like we could have like joined in solidarity and like resisted the pull of the matrix, and now you're like you're already out and laughing at me, dude. What? Come on, man. <laughs> But it is useful. It's use, use, it is useful to have. So I, you know, I will pull it out occasionally. But uh. I don't use it as a phone. Uh, it's more of a, you know, internet connected data device for getting messages and stuff. So you're not going to be able to help me through this. I'm on my own, is what you're saying. Well, what do you need help with? I just, uh, I need help balancing <laughs> my life. Come on, man. <laughs> well, I'm telling you, don't, don't, uh, you just be, you know, just be cognizant of. How much you're using it? Because, but, but dude, dude, think about like Facebook and its effect on the world and information and consciousness. Think about like you know the always onness. Think about like so like VR reality headsets are going to become like a, a thing. Like your advertising ID that follows you from website to website. The uh, internet of things with every appliance connected and your personal information everywhere. Data breaches. And this entire world sucking us down this whirlpool of <laughs> digital despair. And you're going to be on the outside going, see you later, Ben. <laughs> I'm going to go check out the eclipse while you fall into the matrix. Bye. Oh, dear. Yeah, I, I, I actually, no, honestly, I thought that you were going to be, you know, able to like kind of guide me through this, but fine. No, I, you know, I, 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 obviously I see the value of having a smartphone. I mean, it's, it's incredibly convenient uh thing to have uh, but you just have to be very careful about how much you how much time you spend on it and and i do that by not owning one myself and and just when i ever interact with it i'm typically at work using it it's it's put away somewhere where i can't reach it in the car and when it's at home it's in a certain place where i don't i'm not carrying it with me all the time yeah so uh, it's sensible what you say I just look at it as in the context of how many of these influences are ramping up in society and accelerating, yeah. right? And in my own personal environment. And so the idea of balancing and the right level, that all makes sense. And that is, you know, what I'm going to try and do. And yet I kind of, there's another part of me that feels like if I don't make a principled binary stance one way or the other, that I am doomed to be pulled in one direction or the other. It's like, I'm either going to be strapped with an Oculus Rift on my head 24-7, <laughs> or, or I'm going to be a Quaker, <laughs> right? Like, that's, that's my anxiety. There's no in-between for you. Yeah, it's concerning. So we'll have to monitor this going forward. You just got to be, you just can't, you just have to be aware of it. Um, you, can, you can have a smartphone and still have the balance. You don't have to be the Quaker. Yeah. I, um, I, 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 you know, I, I resisted it for years and years and years, but when they gave me one at work, uh, then I started using one and it, you know, it is very useful to have in certain situations when you, Hey, I, I, I can look up the Wikipedia right now. I'm standing on the sidewalk. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I mean, it literally is the hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy. Exactly. But you just, you just can't let it run your life though. <laughs> so Tom, uh, we, yeah. we had mentioned in a previous episode 
uh, about a movie. I'm sure none of our listeners have heard of this movie, but you you are eating up a lot of the spoilers online, and <laughs> okay, yes, we're excited and anticipating. Yeah, Rogue One. Rogue One. Yeah. So as of this recording, Rogue One is probably still out in the theaters. Yeah, but I think it's it's been out long enough that we can talk about it and spoil it. Okay. So yes, our standard issue: we spoil movies here at Two Bit Geeks. <laughs> That's our specialty. You got a movie, we will spoil the heck fire out of it. <laughs> so um. Yeah, we had we had mentioned it in uh, when we were talking about spoilers because we were talking about how spoiler free or rich you like to be, and and uh, and you were saying that in general you you kind of can't resist the uh, especially when it comes to to Star Wars movies that you yeah. you consume that. And and in, the, in fact, we noted that the story about it having uh, significant reshoots that occurred last summer. Yes, and we we and in the context of that we discussed the Disney acquisition of the franchise and what they might do with it and how that might change. Now we can see the result of those reshoots and what uh, potential effect they had. Yes, we can. <laughs> and and we we have both seen this movie now and uh Tom there've been a, a a billion reviews of Rogue One. There has, yeah. Uh some quite entertaining. But, but I, I, the thing I'm most interested in, though, uh, from from your perspective, is just is just how happy or sad you were at the end of it, <laughs> because because you were really excited about this one, right? Um, I was moderately excited about just just being of the right age and being a Star Wars nerd, right? Um, I was, you know, we've been burned in the past, so you you can't get your expectations up too high. Yeah, and let's let's not let's not under let's not undersell that. Like we have been on the. Uh, on the uh, slopes of the volcanoes of Mustafar burned in the past. <laughs> yes. Yes. To use a turn of phrase, uh, you know, given the, given the prequels. We actually haven't had an in-depth discussion about the prequels, but I'm going to presume that your take on the prequels is that you could pull out certain sections that were good, but overall kind of a travesty? Um, for the most part, yeah. I, I wouldn't call them travesties, but um, they certainly were not the movies we were looking for. <laughs> These are not the <laughs> Move along now. Nothing to see here. All right. So, so you, 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 you generally ascribe to the notion that the prequels were a disaster, maybe not as much of a disaster as most people make them out to be? Is that what I'm hearing from you? My opinion is that the original trilogy is clearly superior than the prequel trilogy, yes. Okay. But like, so like when we, we touched briefly at, on the conclusion of Force Awakens... Um, but we didn't do a full review, but my, my feeling after Force Awakens is that I was just so happy that the franchise had been resurrected from the ashes that I... Yeah, I, I was very happy with Force Awakens. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Like, like when I grade the individual Star Wars movies, Force Awakens is the only movie that I give extra credit to. <laughs> okay, yes. Like, to cut to the chase on Force Awakens, because we're not here to review Force Awakens, you know, I, I objectively give it a B. But then I give it like seven extra credit points for, for rescuing the franchise. So, <laughs> yes. And turning it into his assignment on time. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. So, that being said, Tom, the lights go up, the movie's done. What, what did you think of Rogue One? What was, your, what was your visceral, emotional, yay or nay feel on it? Um, I had problems with it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was entertaining enough, but it wasn't good enough for me to want to immediately go see it again and in fact i've only seen it the one time i'll probably i'll probably wait a while before i see it again yeah it it uh it didn't blow me away no so, uh, i had a similar reaction at the end where i was i just felt like entirely nonplussed like i hadn't been emotionally moved in any direction yeah yeah i agree i agree i, I thought large parts of it were just utterly forgettable um, I mean, the, the third act was basically salvaged the movie for me. I mean, yeah. the first, first two thirds of the movie are just absolutely forgettable. <laughs> yeah. So I think pretty much the concerns of Disney and the reshoots seem to have been justified. <laughs> yeah. And, and in fact, I mean, the, supposedly the reshoots were mostly the part of the movie that was enjoyable was the end. How does it slot in with the other six uh, or other seven movie Star Wars oh, movies that you've seen? That is a good question, Tom. So, okay, so we'll circle back to some other 
things I wanted to get your take on about specific things in the movie. But but it did make me think, okay, and this is a kind of a mental exercise we can perform at the release of any Star Wars movie, which is, okay, we now have eight Star Wars movies uh, in the can, right? Yeah. So where do they... Where do they fit in terms of the pantheon of what are the best movies and what, what are not the best movies? And to me, it, it's most helpful to kind of slot them into tiers rather than mm-hmm. have to say exactly what is number one, what is number two, what is number precisely. I mean, that can be fun too, but I, I, I tend to think it's more helpful to think of it in terms of like like, like the, the well-known five-star convention. So to me, my current slots, and I would be curious to see what your take on this is. Uh, I have New Hope and Empire as the two five-star movies. Yep, I agree. I then have, in no particular order, Force Awakens and Return of the Jedi as four-star movies. By four-star, I mean very good, some, some definite and documented flaws, but on the whole, you know, enjoyable, I would see them again, etc. I would put Rogue One as my only three-star movie. In, and I, I make it a three star because I think it is, at least from my experience, definitely not as good as Force Awakens or, or Jedi. It's clearly below that tier. But this is a movie with multiple flaws. I see Rogue One as a movie with multiple flaws. Yeah, it is. However, it is not the disastrous dumpster fire of any of the prequels. <laughs> like, this is the thing about, like, how do you rate... It's, it's actually, you know, to, to sort of turn it on its head from, like... The one good thing that the prequels brought us was a a parameter to the, now refer to. You know, they've what do you call it? We've we've bounded the the limits of 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 good and bad quality. That that's the floor, right? So you could take episodes one, two, and three and put them in whatever order you want to. It's kind of like when you're looking at stuff on Amazon. Are you ever really comparing the one star versus the two star reviews, <laughs> right? So to me, it doesn't really matter. Those are all in the one or two star uh, rating scale. Yeah, I think I might have a, uh, I think I probably have a similar ranking as you. Uh, although I, if pushed, I might slot Rogue One even lower than Revenge of the Sith. Really? If you can believe that, yeah. I mean, Revenge of the Sith is clearly the best of the prequels. Um, and I just thought there was a lot of problems with Rogue One that, I mean, even though Lucas... Uh, you know, didn't really make the movies we wanted to see in the prequels. Yeah. He still s- told the story he wanted to tell. Yeah. And I don't think they did that in Rogue One. I, I think they really struggled just getting the story right. I would, I would agree. They, they didn't really tell a compelling story. <laughs> One of the many yeah. problems with this movie. Uh, touching on the prequels a little bit, I actually had an emotionally very negative reaction to the, the two aspects of the film that harkened back to the prequels. So you had you had Bail Organa, Jimmy Smith re- mm-hmm. re- reprising his role. To so to see an actor from the prequels was not a pleasant experience for me. Okay. And uh and then the silly little Castle Vader on Mustafar there. I'm like, right. I don't need to see a location from the prequels. <laughs> like let's pretend they don't exist. And so to me this sort of implies that Disney is not rejecting out of hand the prequels in terms of their management of the franchise canon going forward. Which, I mean, given the money they're going to be able to extract out of it is a good business choice. There was, there was a, a small bit of hope in Force Awakens where J.J. Abrams had several moments where you can imply he was taking shots at the prequels and saying that, uh, that we're, we're not doing the prequel thing. But, but I think this kind of solidifies that no... They are embracing the. <laughs> well, no, I, I liked that. I liked that we saw Bail Organa in there hmm. in, in Rogue One. Um, I, I, I like a universe that is internally consistent, and it, it makes sense for him to be there. Uh, yeah. So, I, you know, I liked, I liked seeing that. Um, they could probably have done without the visit to Mustafar. And that, and that scene with Vader was not particularly compelling, just the way it was written and performed. So, simply the inclusion of Vader and how Vader was treated in his two scenes. What, what did you think of that? I, I liked that he was in it. I, I liked seeing old classic Vader again, particularly the the final scene with Vader was was what everyone wanted to see from Vader. Yes, that that to me was one of the best scenes of the whole movie when he exactly is just making hay with with killing rebels. That was fantastic. The way he just plowed through that group. I, I would have liked if he had interacted with the main characters besides Krennic. Yeah, 
Um, I, I don't think that other scene where he met with Grinnick was, was necessary or, or even advanced the plot at all. No, it didn't at all. <laughs> Actually, it's funny with, with how much editing and reshooting they did. So much of the movie didn't advance the plot at all. The one thing I had, re- reaction I had from the, from the video, other than not liking the volcano planet, and his silly little lines about choking on your aspirations. His helmet was very shiny. Was it? <laughs> Did you notice that? I didn't notice. I was like, I, I could not take my eyes off. It really distracted me from that whole scene. I'm like, <laughs> it is buffed beyond compare. Like, I was like, is somebody getting ready to give him away at his wedding? I'm like, where's the carnation? This is like, it felt very like hyper polished CGI. Well, he just got out of the bath. Come on. <laughs> Yes, it's true. Ah, yeah. So that really distracted me. But yeah, I, I guess I, I, I liked seeing him in it. I, I just wish they had handled it, handled it, that a little better. So, so what did you? How did you feel about the inclusion of the other original trilogy characters? So I thought the way that they handled the C three PO and R two D two cameo was perfect. Absolutely perfect. They get like a three second, oh, hey, look, there, there, there go the ships, bye, and they're done. <laughs> you get these droids in the movie, boom, done, move on. To me, that's, that's the way that you do um, a cameo. That was a cameo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, you didn't need some silly, irrelevant, not plot related s- scene to, um, to justify their inclusion. So that was fine. The thing I had more of a problem with was, was just the over-the-top, hit-you-in-the-head fan service. Oh, God, there was way too much fan service in this film. And, 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 we're, and we're fans. I mean, we are the original generation of fans watching this movie, and there was just way too much of it. Like, like to me, the way that you do it in the right way is that you make it subtle. Yes. And by definition, if you are shining a spotlight on the fan service, it's not fan service. The one fan service they had in the movie that was really good, I thought, was including the archive footage of Gold Leader and Red Leader. That was perfect. That, I could not agree more. I actually didn't realize that that was archive footage until I had read about it. And so I was like, that's, that's a perfect example. But the, but the, 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 two, the two guys from the, from the Moss Eisley cantina being see, seen on Jeddah, that was just terrible. Absolutely awful. Awful. No, no point of that happening. And, and, and that, that doesn't make sense in the consistency of the universe either, which, which is why it drives me bonkers no, to see that kind of stuff. No, that was, that was horrendous. The, the, they had a shot of the chessboard again. I want to take yep. that chessboard from Millennium Falcon and burn it on Mustafar. Man. That is, <laughs> and, and the scene where they stopped the whole movie and they had a big font description and uh, they did a five-minute dance sequence about, hey, everybody, look at the blue milk. <laughs> I'm just like, yes, run me out of the theater for that. So, oh yeah, that was another thing. Oh, so we're totally jumping around, but I hated, hated the uh, labels of the planets. But, so forget about the fact that we're going to like 17 different locations in the first 30 seconds. If, if you have to expel out exactly where you're going and you're not in a Mission Impossible movie, you're in trouble. Like it, what it totally reminded me of other than the fact that it was a very poor choice of font, because I'm a topography geek as well. <laughs> I'm like, come on, dude. Did you ever see the original Dune in the theaters? The Frank Herbert version? I have not, no. I saw this as a kid with my dad, because he was all into the Dune books. So they literally handed you out a piece of paper with all the terminology, <laughs> right? Of Arrakis and the spice. And, uh, yep. and then they had an intermission in the middle of the movie. And then you can't, and it was, you know, Needless to say, a Dino De Laurentiis disaster. Yeah, if, if you need a cheat sheet, you're not doing enough to tell the story correctly. Exactly. So that, to me, is what was indicative of that. And, it's, and just, just the whole tenor of it was each of one of these scenes are loosely connected advertisements for toys, video games, and animation series. Like, like do you watch the Star Wars Rebels? Animation series. Uh, I have I have not watched Rebels. I, I've just started watching Clone Wars just because apparently it's canon now. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Saw Gerrera is from the C- Clone Wars animated series. So, so, so this was another thing, not just Saw Gerrera, but I was you know, just reading in terms of what they included. There's apparently 
like over a dozen references to minor characters in Star Wars Rebels. Uh, which, again, it's fine, except that it just creates this whole feel of this was just a really, it, this is what it kind of felt like to me, is that this is just a really long trip through the universe that was advertising the franchise. And, you know, really made no attempt to tell a unique and compelling story outside of, of the fact that it was in the universe. To, to me, the, the litmus test should be, if, if none of this happened in the Star Wars universe, would it be an interesting movie? And, uh, and I can't say as, as it really would have been. No, it wouldn't. So The other thing that really annoyed me um, was that this movie had a really interesting twist that they totally botched, I thought. The twist being that the thermal exhaust ports was an intentional flaw put into the plans by the designer. Right. I actually was cool with that as a, as a plot element. I was like, hey. That's a, that's, yeah, that's a great idea. And that, that complements the original trilogy. But they kind of just introduced it in the film as just a, in, in the little hologram voiceover that the guy does. Yeah. R- rather than introducing it in some dramatic manner. Right, right. No, it was like, oh, hey, look, you did this great solution, and then you're just going to bury it in page 37. Exactly. So. exactly. The biggest thing that, make me want, that made me want to throw up was... <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, Disney. <laughs> exactly. Although, although they're getting my money next time, so it's like, yep. they don't really, they're not really that concerned. Dude, what, what is your reaction to this word? Stardust. Yeah. So... How many times did he have to call her Stardust? Leading up to, what's the passcode on the plans for the Death Star? <laughs> oh, wait, I know what it is. It's Stardust. And then she turns to the camera, the lights go up in the theater, and she says, point blank to everybody, because it's me. <laughs> like, are we four years old? <laughs> Like how much I I was just so upset at that moment. These these movies are made for kids. You got to remember. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing. I yeah. So I'm I'm trying to get genuinely upset, but I kind of feel like I've destroyed. I've personally destroyed my ability to either really enjoy or get really upset at these films from endlessly meta reflecting on them. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, uh, before Force Awakens came out, I remember seeing. Jedi again with with my uh, kids and their friends and uh, there are definitely sections of it that are quite dated <laughs> yeah. so I'm, I remember seeing Jedi and being like oh well I guess I had a different experience back then as a kid it really makes me question how how objectively can I really pan or or laud these movies and because when I, so when I went to full disclosure on the prequels right so I mean I want to have the geek cred of hating on the prequels but when I saw the first one in the theater, mm-hmm. it was like the first movie I had seen in a long time. Because my kids were really, really young at that point. And, and it was the first time I had gotten out of the house in like a long time, right? <laughs> and I was so elated to see the movie. I remember loving the pod racing scenes. And I was like, oh, I guess Anakin was a little annoying, but whatever. And Brother X could not believe how much I enjoyed the movie. And I was like, mm-hmm. dude, they... All the characters could have been Jar Jar Binks, and I still would have liked the movie. <laughs> like, yeah. in, in defense of the prequels, I mean, they're they're well constructed movies. They make sense. They have internal logic. Mm. They each scene flows to the next scene, mm. and they they work as movies and in a way that Rogue One doesn't. It's just that the choices, particular aesthetic choices that Lucas made, you know, really great our sensibilities. That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah, he 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 was capable of actually telling a story. Even even though you may have problems with how he told it, and then in isolation, there's certain scenes in those prequels that are very enjoyable as well. Yeah, all the lightsaber duels are fun to yeah, watch. That's true. That's true. Did you like all of the ships, the old ships and the new ships that were trotted out during the, mostly during uh, the third act? Yeah, I did. I did like that. I mean, I think the third act is is clearly the most enjoyable part of the movie. Yeah, uh, the battle at um, Scarif is is uh, fun for a lot of yeah. reasons. I, I was a little disappointed in missed opportunity for some of the older ships. Like, I love seeing the AT-AT walkers. Mm-hmm. I was, and so when they first show them, I'm like, oh, hey, cool. They're going to do something new and interesting with how these things either attack or get taken down. 
And they sort of just get blown up by the X-Wings. I'm like, oh, that's it? Yeah, they kind of just showed up as kind of more of fan service. Yeah, it's like, if you're going to have something like that, then do something with it, right? Don't, don't... Yeah, and, and, and it's in a new interesting location that we haven't seen in the Star Wars universe before. Yeah, and I actually like that outdoor sunlit um, tropical venue. I thought that was a fun place for a battle. And they, mm-hmm. like, they could have done some really cool things and... Perhaps they did. <laughs> you know, and if you look, if you look at the original trailers uh, for the movie, there's yeah. so many scenes that were just didn't have, never appeared in the final cut. So it's just the the, the amount of reshoots they did is yeah. is considerable. So I, I will throw one bone to Disney, which is, so they did a bunch of reshoots. The question that we don't know was this actually some amazing, wonderfully acted, beautifully narrated you know, one-off war story that Disney didn't want and so they transformed it into this? Or was it a total mess that they salvaged into something serviceable? I think it's clearly the latter. <laughs> the, 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 whole, the whole first two-thirds of the movie feels like a movie that was basically constructed in editing as a salvage operation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I tend to agree with you. So the big subtopic I wanted to ask you about from the movie yeah. is what, what did you think of CGI Tarkin? Um, there's obviously a lot of uncanny valley going on there. Oh, I'm so uh, happy that you mentioned that phrase. I had never <laughs> learned this phrase until after looking into this movie and trying to figure out why I had such a revulsion to CGI Tarkin. <laughs> okay. I had never heard about the uncanny valley. Oh, really? It's been, a, that's a phrase that's been around for a while. It's obviously very applicable in this circumstance, both for the CGI Tarkin and the CGI Leia. Yes. So this is a, a phrase uh, originated by a Japanese roboticist in the 70s who basically described the experience of how when an inanimate object acquires some very base human characteristics, we think it's kind of cute and charming. Like if you put like cartoon eyes on a toaster and as you get, as you get more and more human characteristics, it becomes more likable. But then there's this, what they call the uncanny valley, where it's not quite human, but it's not quite inanimate, and it's it's like this zombie uh, version where it looks human, but the eyes quite aren't right, but it's not moving quite right, and you are simultaneously repulsed by it and have a, a feeling of familiarity because it's human, and so you the the uncanny valley, and so this is what happens. Yeah. This was my reaction to CGI Tarkin. It's like, oh, wow, really impressive technical feat that they got a computer animated version of an actor who, who's, who's no longer here. But the eyes really bothered me. Did, what was your, was your visceral reaction to him? I liked that he was in there because it made sense to, to him be in the story. Yeah. Uh, I, th- I think, in fairness to Rogue One, I, I think they're getting towards the other side of the valley. I think they're, they're getting closer to the other, the other side where these things will be more acceptable. And in fact, I've read in various places on the internet, people who, who weren't familiar with the character of Tarkin or Peter Cushing as an actor uh-huh. didn't realize that this was a digital creation. Really? So I, I think it's only the obsessive Star Wars nerds like this who really have seen the original film, you know, a hundred times that can notice the details that are off in Tarkin huh. and Leia. But they, they seem to be steadily improving on this. So at some point, we're not going to be talking about the Uncanny Valley anymore. That's interesting. I I don't know if I would quite agree with you. Well, I mean, my reaction was that uh, it was looked pretty uh, unnerving to see Peter Cushing on screen <laughs> moving around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, it's certainly improved on you know digital characters that have appeared in films in the past. Okay, yeah, I I I, I can see that. However, I think it was a big mistake to include him like that because to me, unless you get it perfect, unless it's seamless and unnoticeable, you shouldn't use it. If it's going to be jarring, you shouldn't include it simply because it's technically impressive. Um, I didn't feel it was that jarring. Huh. It was noticeable, but wasn't it wasn't worse than a lot of the other problems in the film. I mean, that wasn't the, that wasn't the, <laughs> the worst problem the film had was the inclusion of Tarkin. Damning with faint praise, you are Tom. So I, maybe the the other reason why it was so unnerving to me is that when I think back to why Peter Cushing was such a powerful character in the original, is that he had this cold, calculating ruthlessness about him that was pure intimidation and fear. And that is, that is absent in the Rogue yeah, One. Yeah, like the Peter Cushing of, I'm sorry, the, uh, 
the Moff Tarkin of Rogue One is, I want to suck your blood. I am a ghoul. <laughs> like, I, I'm going to intimidate you with my, like, you know, crazy eyebrows and nutty stares. Like, where, you know, Peter, so the original Star Wars came out in 1977. And, and, for, uh, and there was uh, a lot of the, the stylization of the Empire that was quite evocative of the, uh, the SS. Uh, and Peter Cushing was was sort of the uh, epitome of that, his his character, and um, he has this. You may fire when ready. You know, of of, of, co- of course we're going to blow up this planet. He just has this. He has zero heart, right? And that is what just puts ice in your veins. And 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 it's the opposite effect here in Rogue One. So it's it's the the difference with between those two things that I I experienced is particularly. Yeah, I found the vocal performance more distracting than the, the visual appearance mm. of Tarkin. I mean, I think with the stronger vocal performance, that uh, character would have been more effective. Yeah, uh, and so I was. It made me think of how uh, representing uh, a human purely digitally is is one aspect of CGI, and it just made me think of CGI in general uh, and, and how it's used, um, and, and how CGI could be sort of two things. It can be either creating the completely unreal or trying to simulate the real. Okay, obviously the Star Destroyer is unrealistic, but it doesn't bother me because it's not trying to be real, mm-hmm. right? It's like, you, okay, your mind just accepts that because it's not trying to fake you out. Right, or, or all the alien species that show up as digital characters. Those are perfectly fine to accept. Right, because you're, like, oh, you're not comparing it to something else. And so it's, I, th- I think when CGI goes wrong, it's when it's trying to impress you versus trying to be, to be seamless. You've seen a lot more of these Marvel movies than than I have, and uh, like when I think about Doctor Strange, there was no pretense about that being realistic, and so it was right. CGI a go go, and that wasn't bothersome. And you have nothing to compare it to in your in your your own personal experience. Yeah, and so when you're doing something that's not Star Warsy or Doctor Strangey, and you use a lot of CGI, I think that can be really jarring. Uh, I should say unsatisfying. It's like eating eating cotton candy. I, I notice in some of these action films that are very CGI heavy, the, like the physics seems like all bouncy and off. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like you you can get it pretty good, but because it's not real, and because it's it's not even an enhancement of the real. Sometimes it's just purely CGI. There's some part of the human reaction to that that is just not natural and and i don't know if that's totally will be totally solved simply by advancement in cgi one of the things that i think uh rogue one and force awakens gets gets right in this in this arena is that they've started using more real uh physical sets compared to the prequels which lucas did it basically everything on front of green screen mm. uh I, I think that's a certainly an improvement and integration of the digital features with the actual physical sets on on set is is that's a step in the right direction i think for the star wars universe yeah to, to use it as, a, as an enhancement right rather than just a way to substitute having to build all these sets for your actors um i mean there's an advantage of 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 having digital sets in that you can create really wacky stuff but to have an actual physicality to some of these things that the actors perform on yeah. is it comes through in the film i remember seeing uh, Fellowship of the Ring for the first time and thinking that that was a perfect example of balanced use of CGI where you have some ridiculous things that are unreal like the the Balrog with his wings by the way and and, and then uh, then a lot of the stuff just feeling natural and organic and yeah the best digital effects are, are those that, that you don't really notice are digital mm. I think the best the best recent example of that that I've seen is Mad Max Fury Road there's a lot of digital effects in that but you wouldn't notice. Ah, that, you know, so that's a movie that intrigued me that I did not see for one reason or the other. Um, I remember that getting a lot of accolades for being a pure nonstop action movie. Yes. Ra- rather uniquely so. Yes. In my opinion, it's the best action movie ever made. Really? Yes. <laughs> it, I, I really, really enjoyed that film. Mad Max Fury Road. Yes, but you have to you have to completely surrender to it. You can't you can't try to critically assess it as a different kind of film than it is. <laughs> if you if you just go in there and just say I just want to see a lot of stuff blow up, <laughs> it is the it is the Citizen Kane of action films. <laughs> oh, wonderful! So it so for a um 
for sensitive soul like myself, Tom, is is the explicit content um, meter off the charts or? No, no, it's it's not uh, it's not anything worse than you've ever seen. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you should see it. It's 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 absolutely worth seeing. So circling back to roller coaster, is it like a pure adrenaline roller coaster, just thrill ride? <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. It's it it is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it is like bonkers cuckoo nuts. Cool. So it like it gives you some like ridiculous absurd scene. You're like, okay, that's ridiculous absurd, but it just keeps on coming. But it, it keeps on it, coming. It keeps on coming, and then they turn around and they keep on coming back at you again the other way. <laughs> Like it, it ups the ante and then ups the ante and then. Yes. Okay, cool. So where were we? We were, we were, we were, we were. Is there, is there anything salvageable out of Rogue One that we can take away as a positive? Hmm. I'm glad that it exists, I guess. Yeah. I mean, this, I guess, this is a similar reaction I had to coming out of some flawed Star Trek movies. Actually, when, when J.J. Abrams rebooted the Star Trek franchise, and I was thinking, thinking about it critically and, and the, the flaws that there were in that movie. I was like, at least, mm -hmm. at least they're making movies. At least, at least yeah. they're making movies that are, are pretty good. <laughs> right? Yeah, at least we're going to get a new Star Wars movie every year for the foreseeable future. I mean, we can be happy with that. Yeah, and, you know, and, and some of them might be really good. Yeah, Force Awakens was really good. Yeah. was really enjoyable. Yeah, so I actually, if I had to roll the dice, I, I would predict that uh, Episode Eight upcoming will be... This, this is our best chance to get a five, another five-star movie. I feel like, especially in trilogies, the, the narrative responsibility of the second movie is, is the lightest, right? You don't have to intro and set everything up, and you don't have to tear it down and conclude it either. So you, it's the most freedom to stretch. And then you have Attack of the Clones. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so sad. Hey everyone, thanks for listening. If you'd like to discuss this episode or anything else related to the podcast, check out our subreddit at 2bitgeeks.reddit.com. Thanks for your support. <laughs>